Hi friends, welcome back to our channel if you've seen our videos before, and if you're new, my name is Abby, and today it is time for my second quarterly reading wrap-up. So if you missed my first quarter reading wrap-up, I will link it in a card up there, that was January through March of 2021, so today will be April through June of 2021. I'm going to be going over every book that I read, what I thought, what rating I gave it, something about the synopsis, and I'm going to try to move fast, because last time was really long, because I got really fangirly. So we're going to try not to let that happen again, but let's be real, it probably will. <laughs> I have 21 books to talk about this quarter, which is a little bit less than maybe I wanted to read, because I do aim to hit around 100 books a year, and last quarter I hit 25 books. This quarter was a smidge smaller, but that's okay. I don't mind. So let's get into talking about the books that I read, because I read some pretty great ones. So in April, I only finished five books, which is really slow for me. That's, that's like not very many at all. I kind of was in a bit of a reading slump, I think, um, but the five that I did read, I really enjoyed. So there is that. <laughs> the first book that I finished in April was Golgotha by Angela R. Watts. I have yet to be disappointed by one of Angela's books. This is a high fantasy story that is set in a world where magic is outlawed, or at least dark magic, is very much against the rules. We follow the story of Prince Moray, who is set to take the throne in just a couple of months when our story starts from his father when he retires, because in this world the king can retire, which I think sounds like a great way to run a monarchy. Granted, I don't know anything about politics of a monarchy, but I feel like the king should be given the opportunity, not necessarily to abdicate, but he can retire and pass it on to his heir, just like when the heir is ready and when he's ready to let it go. I think it's nice. I think it's nice. So Moray is set to take the throne, um, but what his father, the king, does not know is that Moray has been dabbling in some dark magic. We also have points of view from Moray's brother Finnegan, um, who is the younger prince, and also Princess Ama, who is betrothed to be married to Prince Moray in order for him to take the throne. He has to get married before he can ascend to the throne. Through a series of unfortunate events, Moray, Finnegan, Amma, and Gunnar, who is, I believe, sent to protect Princess Amma by the, her brother, I think? They all fall into Golgotha, which is this scary as all get out, like, hell world, and they have to try and fight their way back, but no one's ever survived. It's like where they put people when they exile them, they send them to Gol Golgotha so they never come back. <laughs> it's all about fighting for your life. Um, figuring out who you are, uh, family, and faith, and it's fantastic. I really enjoyed this. This is the first book in, I believe, a trilogy. It might be a duology. I'm really not sure. But I'm really excited to see where the next stories go. I loved Moray's arc. He really has a huge redemption arc in this book, and I just thought it was beautiful. And I gave it 4.5 stars. I really loved it a lot. It was very much you know, a classic fantasy adventure, which is something that I love. So if you're in the mood for something like that, this is definitely one I would recommend. Uh, content warning, there's a lot of violence and some demonic activity, but none of it is like smiled upon. It's all frowned upon, if that makes sense. The next book that I listened to on audiobook in April was The Moving Finger by Agatha Christie. So far this year, I have managed to read at least one Agatha Christie book every month, and I'm loving it. I think she's a fantastic writer. I have loved getting into each and every one of her mysteries. Um, the Moving Finger was my first Miss Marple mystery, and I love Miss Marple so much. She's delightful. She's so delightful. So I'm gonna be honest, I picked this one up because the premise reminded me of that one episode of Murder, She Wrote that Parker Stevenson was on. In this story we follow Jerry who has suffered a pretty massive uh, injury to his legs um, and his doctors basically say, you're patched up enough to leave the hospital so now what we want you to do is find this tiny little town in the countryside where nothing ever happens, stay there for several months, and let yourself recover. Um, so he and his sister go to this tiny town called Limstock where, according to most of the locals, nothing ever happens. But of course, since that's the beginning of a mystery, something's gonna happen. Um, what ends up happening is there are these anonymous letters that have been going out to various members of the community, accusing them of wrongdoings in their past. Some of them are true, some of them are completely 
made up and one of those letters does lead a member of the community to commit suicide. So the question, the mystery behind this whole thing is really who is writing these letters. And I thought this was so much fun. I gave it four stars. I really enjoyed it. I loved Jerry and his sister. I loved their rapport. I loved their relationship. Um, I loved getting to meet Miss Marple for the first time, even though she doesn't come in until like the last quarter of the book. She kind of just swoops in at the end, solves the whole thing, and that's it. Um, but I really love her character. I think she's fantastic. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed this one. The next book that I finished in April was Dearest Josephine by Caroline George, and I can already tell you guys this is going to be one of my favorite books of the year. I absolutely adored this book so much that I bought myself a copy so that I could go back and underline all of my favorite bits. Ah, this book is just everything. This follows the story of Josie. Her father has recently passed away and left her an estate um, with this kind of crumbling old British manor um, that he was going to fix up before he got sick. So Josie goes to finish the renovation and maybe sell it. She doesn't really know what she wants to do with it. While she is there in an old desk, she finds a pile of letters addressed to a Josephine de Clare, which is her name, written by a boy named Elias in 1821. It's a mix of a modern rom-com and a Jane Austen Regency romance and it's told all in emails, text messages, the letters from Elias and the novel that Elias was writing and throughout it you get a story of love and grief and what you do, how you feel when chapters are closed too soon and it's just beautifully written, it's beautifully done. I love Caroline George's writing style and I gave this five stars, and I also love this cover. Love this cover so, so much. It's just beautiful. There are dancing scenes and like wandering moors scenes and scenes of fixing up an old house. And like, it's just, it's just fantastic. It's like a Hallmark movie and a period romance movie came together and put themselves in this book. And I just, I love it so much. I love it so much. <laughs> I also cried like a little baby right at the end, so there's also that. <laughs> the next three books that I finished, I didn't actually finish these like chronologically, they weren't back to back, but I'm gonna just talk about them all at the same time. Um, that was The Hollow Boy, The Creeping Shadow, and The Empty Grave, all by Jonathan Stroud. These are books three, four, and five in the Lockwood and Company series. I adore this series and I'm so glad that I finally managed to finish it. I just loved these books so, so much. The Hollow Boy got four stars from me and then The Creeping Shadow and The Empty Grave both got five stars. The series as a whole follows Lucy Carlyle. They're told first person from her perspective. We are set in an alternate version of London where ghosts are real and they are causing problems and only young people can see them. So kids and teens have all been basically drafted by the government to join agents Agencies. If they have the skills to hunt ghosts, these agencies go in and take care of the ghosts, take care of the problems, find their sources and destroy them, and all of that stuff. So the first two books are kind of just that. We're going in, we're destroying ghosts, we have a lot of spooky encounters. The last three books in the series, we kind of uncover the bigger plot of everything that's going on. There's kind of a conspiracy behind the scenes going on with some of the bigger agencies and I thought it was fantastic. I think my favorite thing about this is just the world. Jonathan Stroud does a fantastic job world building this almost a magic system of how the ghosts work, the different levels, the different types of ghosts, what you use to combat them. It really feels like a magic system in a lot of ways. I also love the characters Lucy and Lockwood and George and Holly and even in the later books Kips and the skull as well. So I just think it's a fantastic series. If you're looking for something that's a little spookier, I would definitely recommend these. I don't read them after dark because I will get freaked out. And yeah, I'm really happy that I finally read them. The last book that I finished in April was A Murder is Announced by Agatha Christie. This is book four in the Miss Marple series. It's the next one after The Moving Finger, which is book three. I kind of skipped ahead a little just because I really was curious and I really love that episode of Murder She Wrote. So I did, I will go back at some point and read Murder at the Vicarage and The Body in the Library. But for now, I'm plugging right along. Um, a Murder is Announced is about pretty much exactly what it sounds like. In this tiny town, an announcement shows up in the newspaper saying that a murder will occur at this place at this time. Be there or be square, basically. <laughs> 
And a bunch of the townsfolk are morbidly curious and show up and a murder does in fact occur. The inspector brings in Miss Marple who kind of has a bit of an outside connection with this situation and I really liked this one. There was a chunk towards the beginning where Inspector Craddock was just like going around and interviewing people and getting the same thing over and over and over again and it was a little bit boring but after like the halfway point, I couldn't put it down. I was just completely invested. I really wanted to know what had happened. And I gotta say, Agatha Christie, so far I have never seen it coming. I have never seen it coming. In a good way, in a good way. I'm always following a red herring. So that's on me, you know, that's on me. And I also need to mention that in this book, Agatha Christie managed to pull off a plot device that is used a lot in murder mystery TV shows that I've never seen done with words, like without a camera involved. You know how sometimes in an episode of a, of a murder mystery show, Monk and Murder, She Wrote really did this a lot, where it opened and we'd see, kind of see the murder happen, where like we're watching from the killer's POV with the camera, like they're behind the camera, and so then the victim is like, oh, what are you doing here? That whole thing. Yeah, she pulled that off in here, and I still am very impressed by it. I thought it was so cool and kind of blew my mind a little, so yeah. I also gave this one four stars because there was that bit at the beginning that was a little bit boring, but the second half, man, whoo. In the month of May, I read eight books, and the first one of those was The Assassin's Daughter by Jameson C. Smith. This follows Kat and Ed, who are both at, like, this school for assassins. And in this world, it's really interesting. In this world, the firstborn child, from my understanding, I definitely want to get a book two because I need to know more about the, like, politics of this world. But anyway, there's some sort of, like, law in place that like the firstborn child is destined to take on the job that their father had. So pretty much everyone at this assassin school, all of these kids that are here, all of their parents were assassins. And so, or at least their fathers were, and so that's why they're at this school. So we're following Kat and Ed, who are partners in the school. They're like, they're like teamed up, and um, Kat really does not want to be an assassin. And I think this is interesting. I feel like this is the first assassin book, not that I've read a lot of those, but the first book that's like about assassins, where the main character actively does not want to be an assassin. <laughs> I think that's really interesting. Um, I, I've never really read a book like that before, so I thought that was fun. So we follow Kat and Ed as they are going through their like first big assignments uh, as they've just turned 17 and so it's finally time to like become proper assassins. But it's a classic, you know, swords and assassins fantasy. There's like you know, rebellion and conspiracy and maybe who you thought was good isn't necessarily good and I really enjoyed it and I gave it four stars and I'm very much looking forward to the next one. The next book that I finished in May was Six of Crows by Lee Wardugo. If you don't know what this is about, this is a heist story that follows six um, kind of young outcast people in society who are very good at what they do, and what they do is not necessarily legal. So we follow Kaz Brecker as he kind of puts together this team of six dangerous outcasts for one impossible heist to the greatest one of his, like, criminal mastermind career. I really, really enjoyed this. I love a good heist story, I love a good squad, I love a good criminal squad, and I wanted to read this and Shadow and Bone, which I'll talk about in a minute, before the Netflix adaptation of Shadow and Bone came out because three of the characters, actually five of the characters, we get to see five of six crows in season one, now that I take that back, take that back, um, but it is set before the actual events of this, so it's a bit of a prequel to this and kind of weaves the crows, I thought, masterfully into the story of Alina. Um, when normally they don't have anything to do with each other other than that they're set in the same world. This one, content-wise, lots of violence, quite a bit of um, crude language, and some mention of some unsavory dealings, obviously. There were never really any points where I wanted to put this down. I very much was intrigued from the first, and it kept me hooked through a lot of the story. So, yeah, if you love a good heist story set in a fantasy world, I maybe recommend checking this out. I ended up giving this four and a half stars. I took off the half star for the content, just so you know. I really enjoyed this a lot. And now in a complete change of pace, <laughs> complete vibe change, the next book that I finished in May was Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. So I have made it my goal, kind of, 
this year, somewhat last year, but mostly this year I've really been focusing on it to read more of my not Narnia C.S. Lewis collection. I have several of his um, classics in this edition. The C.S. Lewis signature books from Harper One, I love these editions. They're so nice and floppy and they sit open really nice. So I decided to pick this one up and I added it to my Bible reading time. So I would like read a chapter of this and then read a chapter of my Bible and so on and so forth. Um, I really, really liked this. I gave it five stars. I think it's so fascinating. I've been a Christian now for three quarters of my life and I don't think I could break down what Christianity is at its core quite as well as Clive. So if you've been, ever been curious about like what it is that all Christians believe or should believe if they're doing it right, um, this is definitely a great place I think to start. And so this is basically just like all of his observations, the things that he's learned along the way as becoming a Christian and what Christianity is at its core mere Christianity. So yeah, if you're curious what Christianity is supposed to be about, or if you're a Christian, sometimes it's good to just go back to the roots of what we believe, and that's really what he breaks down here, and I really thought it was fantastic. I gave it five stars, and I'm already working my way through more of this collection, and I'm excited to read even more. This was so good. This was so good. The next book that I read in May was Poirot Investigates by Agatha Christie. This was a collection of short stories that she wrote about Poirot and Hastings. There were a couple that Hastings wasn't in, but most of them also had a Hastings. Um, and this is technically, I think, classed as book three in the Poirot series. So I listened to this one on Audible. Richard Armitage narrated it, and I thought he did a fantastic job. It was not my favorite. Uh, some were definitely better than others, and I don't necessarily know that Agatha Christie's writing is best suited for short fiction. I feel like she does best with a full novel to kind of develop all of those red herrings, all those side, maybe it could be this, maybe it could be that, um, where I think the short mystery is really not where she shines, but I really enjoyed it all the same. Um, I just love the character of Poirot, he's just delightful to me. I think he's so much fun, he's the best at what he does, and he knows it, and everyone knows it, and it's all good, so. <laughs> I gave this one four stars, overall I thought it was fine, so. Yeah. The next book that I finished in May was Romanov by Nadine Brandis. This was my second time reading this and I loved it even more, if that's even possible. This is a historical fantasy book based on the story of Anastasia Romanov and the end of the Romanov family. Um, so this follows Nastia as she and her family are carted into exile after being forced off the throne and she, in this version, is smuggling a spell out of the palace with her. So this is full of magic and family and grief and forgiveness and it's just a fantastic story. It's very sad but it does end on a very hopeful note as well and this paperback has an extra bonus scene that I loved so much. It was like it was what I wanted after I finished it the first time. The bonus scene was exactly that. So I loved it so much. I gave this five stars again and honestly, if you are curious about historical fantasy, or you just love the Romanovs, or you like, you know, the musical or movie Anastasia, definitely recommend Romanov. The next book that I finished in May was Shadow and Bone by Lee Bardugo. This is the first book in the Shadow and Bone trilogy, and I'm actually currently reading book two when I'm filming this. So I wanted, like I said earlier, to read this before I watched the show on Netflix, which honestly I have to say I really enjoyed as an adaptation of the first book. I thought it was really nice. I really loved the addition of the crows. They're not in this book, but they are in the show, and I thought it was a really nice way to kind of wrap it all up. So there's definitely some content. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for everyone, but I think if you're curious and you like a good fantasy story, I really liked them. So Shadow and Bone follows Alina. She and her best friend Mal grew up in an orphanage together and now they serve in the army together. She works in cartography and he is a tracker. So they're not technically like working together all the time, but they work together a lot of the time. At the beginning of the story they are attempting to cross the fold, which is this massive swath of just like evil darkness that is has ripped their country in half. And while they're attempting to cross through the fold, uh, an event happens that causes Alina to unleash unknown inner dormant magic that she didn't know she had. So she is whisked off to the world of the Grisha, who are the magic workers in this world, and I really enjoyed it. I didn't have any real complaints other than I really don't, 
I really don't like the romance between the Darkling and Alina. It makes me feel really... Don't. No. I can't. Okay. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. And I'm not just saying that because I'm Team Mal, but legitimately it's kind of, it's creepy. Don't. 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 I do love Ben Barnes, but don't. No. <laughs> So yeah, I had a good time reading it. I absolutely flew through it. It's not hard to read at all, and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, I'm carrying on to book two. In the month of May, I read eight books, and I started the month off by finishing up Reflection by Elizabeth Lim. This was the Tale as Old as Time book club pick for April and May, and I really like this a lot. This is one of the Disney Twisted Tales books, and this one obviously is inspired by Mulan. So in this version, um, Mulan has to travel to the underworld to save the soul of General Shang, who was the man who trained her to be a soldier. She is, through most of this book, disguised as Ping, the male soldier whose persona she takes on to join the troops of China to save her father, and you know how the story goes. Um, but in this version she travels to the underworld and has to face off with King Yama, who uh, agrees with terms to maybe let her journey and attempt to save Shang from dying permanently. So yeah, I really enjoyed this story a lot. I liked how the overall message is really about like you get to choose who you are, and other people don't really get to say who you are. And I thought that was really nice. Uh, there's a scene at the end that really actually brought me to tears, and I didn't quite expect that, but it was just really powerful. So yeah, if you want to hear more of my thoughts, I will link the live show discussion that we did of this book up in a card. And there's not much time left, but if you want to join us for the July discussion, we're going to be talking about Go the Distance, which is another twisted tale inspired by Hercules. You still have like a week and a half, so if you want to join us for that, definitely do. Yeah. The next book that I finished in the month of June was Between Jobs by W.R. Gingell. This is the first book in the City Between series, and I'm gonna be honest, I still don't know what the heck happened in this book. <laughs> I really enjoyed myself while reading it, but do I remember anything? I remember things, but I don't remember what they mean, is really what's happening to me. We follow a character who goes by the name of Pet. She is 17, she's living in her house alone um, since her parents were brutally murdered several years ago, and she is just hoping that the realtor does not succeed in selling the house. And one day, these three mysterious looking guys move in. Um, they actually buy the house and move in. And she basically agrees to become their pet, and basically just means their servant. Like, they, she just cooks for them, she cleans for them, she keeps the house up because it's her house anyway. So she agrees to work for them while they're there and need to use the house, and in exchange they're gonna give her the house. Because now they've purchased the house, so they're just they're gonna give it to her free and scot-free by the end of their murder investigation. Because that's what they're doing. They're investigating a magical murder. And, uh, yeah. It was weird as all get out. This is one of very few urban fantasies that I've maybe ever read, and definitely one of very few I've read set in Australia, so that was kind of cool. I gave it three and a half stars because I was just very confused the whole time. I had a good time, I enjoyed it, it had magic, and fae, and vampires, and all sorts of things going on, but it was very strange. And I am intrigued enough to continue. It's really weird, it's kind of wacky, but it's a lot of fun too. So, yeah. Also the audiobook was Excellent. I really enjoyed it. The next book that I finished in the month of June was The Lost Wonderland Diaries by J. Scott Savage. You can see more of my like active thoughts on this. I'll link up there. I did a reading vlog where I read this one. This is a middle grade story in which we follow Celia, who is the descendant many times removed of Charles Dodgson, aka Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Celia is not really a fan of Alice. She's not really a fan of the story. She doesn't like books in general. She is dyslexic and finds it difficult to enjoy reading, but one day she meets Tyrus, who is very much a bookworm, book nerd. He loves stories and storytelling and video games and movies and all these pop culture things that I just loved about him. And through a series of events, the two of them fall into Wonderland, but it's not quite the Wonderland that they remember. So this was an absolute, just a joy to read. I loved reading it. I love middle grade just so much. It's so wholesome and sweet and like, makes you feel good. I mean, there's definitely some scary parts in here. The White Rabbit's house? No thanks. That was spooky. Anyway. 
this was just a delight to read. I definitely recommend it if you have a middle grade reader who loves Wonderland or fantasy adventures or you yourself love a fluffy feel-good middle grade that's got a little bit of education sprinkled in there. Love to see it and I'm very intrigued to see what a sequel to this would look like. So I ended up giving this one four stars. The next book that I finished in June was Abort by C.D. Hewlin. I do have a physical copy of this but I've actually lent it to my brother so I don't have it to hold up right now but here have a cover. <laughs> I also read this one in that same reading vlog and oh my word I love this so much. This is a sci-fi story we follow Commander Mason Wyatt. He is in space and he has just woken up after nine months of cryosleep and he can't really remember what exactly his mission was um, and the reason for that is because the mission instructions are not in the computer. Now whether that means they were never left in the computer or there's someone else on this ship who has erased them, he doesn't know. Throughout the story he discovers there are 60 million other pods with human lives on board and the story kicks off from there. It's very much an introspective character driven story even while it's a very like action-packed intense sci-fi we're dealing a lot with Mason's past and with the things that he's done, his regrets, and it's so good for such a short book. It's like 150 pages I think and it was just fantastic. If you love a sci-fi, if you love a short book, if you love a pro-life message, if you love a mystery, can't recommend Abort enough. I really, really liked it. Next up, I read We the Wild Things by Brian McBride, another one that I finished in that reading vlog. So in this one, we follow three foster kids, Peter, Will, and Ruth. Peter's mother vanished years ago, and that's what put him in the system, and he is convinced that she has gone off to this place called Neverland. She always told him these stories of Neverland, and it's not quite Peter Pan's Neverland, but it's something similar, it's where all your dreams come true and you never grow old and all that good stuff. So Peter is convinced that if he can just get there, he will find her. And so Will and Ruth are the two who are in his new foster home. They decide to go with him and help him find Neverland and hopefully his mother. So this is a story all about fear and grief and the things that we go through and how they make us who we are, but we choose to become more than our worst moments and it's very heavy. There's a lot of heavy um, content in here, but it's very, very hopeful. I mean, it's just a mesmerizing story. There's a bit of magic, like just a hint of almost a fairy tale magic. I really, really loved it. I would recommend it, but cautiously. There's definitely some triggers I would be aware of going into this. Um, sexual abuse, child abuse, uh, definitely some things that are hard, but I just love that this whole story is about, you know, overcoming those things and becoming a family and I just, I loved it so much. The next book that I finished in June was Jerusalem's Daughter by Jenna Van Maurick, which was a very pleasant surprise. So this is a biblical fiction story set during the Passion Week, which was the week in which Jesus rode into Jerusalem and ended with his crucifixion and resurrection. So it's over that time period, although we do actually have, like, the prologue is like, 10 years prior to that. Our two main characters are Shamira and Asa. Shamira is a part of a very successful shepherding family. They're not well off, but like they're comfortable and they all live in the same house and so like it's a bunch of extended family all in the same house. And then we follow Asa whose father is a high priest and it's very broken <laughs> in his home where Shamira's home is like big and happy and loving. Asa's is very much broken. but. Um, the two of them meet as children and become fast friends and fast track 10 years they have fallen completely in love with each other but there's kind of that barrier of the societal expectations for both of them that's keeping them from taking that next step. They're still really good friends. During the later half of the story, uh, Jesus of Nazareth enters Jerusalem and causes a whole stir. And so we kind of see all of the events of the Passion Week through the eyes of Shamira and Asa, and I thought it was fantastic. I don't read a ton of biblical fiction. It's not something that comes across my radar very often. But this was Jenna's debut and I was very intrigued by it. And what was really funny, what I did not expect, was the fangirling that went on for me over biblical figures. <laughs> Every time 
uh, a familiar face would show up, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I know them! It felt like reading a spin-off of my favorite series and you're seeing your favorite characters again. There's a scene where Asa is going off to find out more about Jesus and he encounters Peter and Lazarus and so it was just, it was really funny. I really enjoyed this story a lot. I cried a little bit at the end, I'm not gonna lie. I gave it four and a half stars. I thought it was fantastic. If you are intrigued at all by biblical fiction or New Testament fiction, I really, really liked it. Thought it was great. The next book that I finished in the month of June was Hope in the Dark by Hannah Wright, and I really enjoyed this one too. This is a historical fiction book set in the 1800s. We follow Lizzie, whose family has just moved cross country in a covered wagon to Idaho. They've left all that they know behind in North Carolina to start a new life out west, and Lizzie becomes the school teacher, the last one kind of left in a bit of a rush and so Lizzie agrees to be the new school teacher in this town because she has a lot of younger siblings and she wants them all to go to school so in order to do that she agrees to teach. She also meets Samuel, a young man who works at the general store in town and there's some sketchy behavior going on from the general store manager and some of the school board and there's a lot of questionable things going on. So there's a bit of a mystery, there's a bit of a romance, and I liked it a lot. Um, the middle of this lagged a bit plot-wise. It slowed down a lot and it kind of, I, I struggled to keep my attention there, but the ending picked back up. I really liked the beginning and the end. The middle was a bit, was a bit of a lull, but I liked the beginning and the end a lot. Um, and I love the characters of Lizzie and Samuel. I really thought they were so sweet. I gave this one three and a half stars. I thought it was pretty good. And the final book that I finished in the month of June. My voice is going. It's been a, a, mar a marathon to get here, but thank you for sticking with me. The final book that I finished was Why Didn't They Ask Evans by Agatha Christie. So this is not a Miss Marple, it's not a Poirot, it is just a standalone mystery, although they did adapt it for the Miss Marple BBC show. The adaptation was questionable. It was somehow even more convoluted than the actual book, and I don't know how they pulled that off, but somehow they managed to do it. This is the story of Bobby, the local vicar's son, and Frankie, an earl's daughter. They've been friends, acquaintances, borderline friends since childhood, and now that they're all grown up, uh, they don't see a ton of each other until Bobby one day is golfing with a friend because that's what you do when you want to kill time as the fourth son of the vicar and you're bored. He is out golfing and he comes across a dying man whose last words are, why didn't they ask Evans? While he is on the train one day, he runs into Frankie and tells her all about this and some sketchy stuff goes down at the inquest and the two of them decide they're gonna solve the mystery together because nobody else will, so might as well be us. So they come up with the most convoluted and harebrained scheme to solve a crime I've ever seen, but I loved it at the same time. It was very complicated, it was very out there, it was in no way anything like Poirot or Miss Marple would have done, which I think was kind of fun. I think this was very much a plot that was driven by only these characters could come up with these situ situations or end up in these scenarios, and I thought that was fun. <laughs> I really liked the characters of Frankie and Bobby. It really kept me guessing until the end, and yeah, I thought it was really fun. I gave this one four stars, and with that we have reached the end of my quarterly reading wrap-up for April, May, and June. Thank you for sticking with me if you're still here. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this. Let me know down below if you've read any of the books that I mentioned, if you're going to read any of the books that I mentioned, or what you're reading right now. Just tell me all of the bookish things in the comments below. I will also link down there at the Tales Oldest Time book club on Facebook, so if you're interested in joining, like I said, we have about a week and a half left, I think, when this is going up before we will be discussing Go the Distance, so if you're interested in joining us for that, I will link that down below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you liked this video. If you did, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe down below for more Disney magic and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss any time we post. And I will see you next time. Bye!